us. So here's your next president of the United States, Dr. Joe Jorgensen. <laughs> much everybody for being out here and thanks for the gorgeous day it's been awesome and I had so much fun in uh, Southern California I wanted to start off by telling you about my grandmother because she's the one who gave me the love I have of my country she's the one who explained how great liberty and freedom were and she was an immigrant she explained how in the old country it didn't matter how much you made and you could work a second or third job and the government would just take it away because they wanted everybody to have the same. And to listen to her stories, it almost sounds like she came from the Soviet Union or maybe an Eastern Bloc country. Actually, she was from Denmark. And unfortunately, we're heading more towards Denmark every day. That's where the politicians are taking us. And I'm here to respond to them by saying that I think that you know what's best for you. And that's why I'm asking you for your vote for President of the United States. As your president, I will get government out of the way so my grandmother's vision of freedom can be a reality for all of us. Our current government is too big, too bossy, too nosy, too intrusive. And besides, what gives them the right? We need to put decision-making power back into your hands because you can spend your money better than any politician, bureaucrat, or special interest in Washington can. Yeah. Woo. Woo. Now, Americans would never budget to spend $80 billion every year to keep families apart from their loved ones, but that's exactly what they're doing with the criminal justice system and their prison system. We cannot claim to be the land of the free when we lead the world in incarcerations. We have 5% of the world's population, but house 20% of its prisoners. And one of the biggest factors that led to a quadrupling in our prison population is a racist and destructive war on drugs. In particular, mandatory minimums have taken discretion out of the hands of judges and force mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters to spend 10, 20 years in jail, sometimes uh, a lifetime for a supposed crime that has no victim. Now, all we have to do is take a step back to the prohibition era to see the parallels. Despite realizing how poorly alcohol prohibition went, what we've created is a carbon copy. Drug kingpins have replaced mob bosses and drug dens have replaced speakeasies. When was the last time you heard of a liquor store owner going up and down the halls of a high school, trying to push gin onto high school students? And when's the last time you heard of a vodka addict breaking into houses in order to support a vodka habit? And when's the last time you heard of two liquor store owners having a shootout for the best corner? What we have now is not a drug problem. What we have is a prohibition problem. There should be no law to prevent you from owning an object, whether it's a gun to protect yourself or drugs for whatever reason you wish. If there is no victim, there is no crime. President, I will federally decriminalize all drugs and encourage states to treat drug use as a health issue, not a criminal issue. We should allow the medical community to deal with substance abuse in a way that salvages lives instead of throwing them away. Accordingly, I will pardon anyone convicted at the federal level of any victimless crime. just a few steps towards ending the over-incarceration of people of color and letting consensual adult activities become safer and destigmatized. In addition to the overcrowding of our uh, federal prisons, the war on drugs has negatively affected our citizens and interactions that many uh, Americans have with police. The drug war has single-handedly created gangs that police themselves often through violence. 
Consequently, the federal government has created a police state, which includes the Drug Enforcement Agency, which spends three billion of our tax dollars annually. They have repeatedly raided medical marijuana clinics where medical marijuana is perfectly legal. And long gone is the friendly patrol officer who knows everybody on the beat by name. Instead, they've been replaced by nameless, faceless SWAT teams from the U.S. government. And it doesn't stop with the DEA. In recent months, we've seen the Department of Homeland Security, which receives another $50 billion in tax dollars, patrolling our streets in military fatigues. As your president, I will defund and I will defund federal involvement in policing, including the DEA and DHS. That means ending the supply of surplus military equipment like tanks and tear gas to over 8,000 federal, state, and local forces. I will end no-knock raids, which too often end up killing innocent people like Breonna Taylor. And as Libertarian Congressman Justin Amash has brought up, when police do misbehave, it's nearly impossible to take legal action because of an arcane doctrine known as qualified immunity, which states that victims can only successfully sue an officer when a clear civil rights violation has already been established in a prior case. When I am your president, I will end qualified immunity so that police are held to the same standard as everyone else. Now, while millions of Americans have suffered from the government's war on drugs, almost every American has been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic in some way. South Korea confirmed its first coronavirus case within a day of our first case and quickly jumped ahead in testing containing the spread. As infections in the U.S. skyrocketed, South Korea nearly eradicated the virus and they did so without any lockdowns. A testing initiative done by Bill Gates, which was the first one that could be used in our country outside of the hospital, processed about 20,000 tests in 10 weeks. And yet on May 12th, the FDA stopped them from further testing and said they needed, quote unquote, further assessment. This is just one example of how the FDA has worsened our COVID-19 crisis and made it extremely difficult for anyone to get tested. Currently, only those companies with enough money and resources can even get FDA approval. And once they do, they weaponize their patents to hold a monopoly. Thanks to the FDA, it costs about 10, or costs about a billion dollars to bring a drug to market, and it's about a 10-year process. Meanwhile, it's the patients who suffer, desperately waiting for a drug that might just save their lives. New medicines and procedures should get to patients as quickly and safely as possible. When I am your president, I will get rid of the efficacy requirement of the FDA, if not the FDA entirely. The FDA is not the only issue Americans in the American healthcare system. Let's be honest, it's not working for anyone. My heart breaks for the millions of Americans who've been left behind, the families who've been bankrupted, for decades, politicians in Washington have blamed it on the free market, saying, therefore, we need to have a single payer system. Well, I have some news for them. We haven't had anything close to a free market in nearly a century. And the alternative to our current big government failure isn't an even bigger government failure. When I hear politicians say we need Medicare for all, what I'm hearing them say is we need VA hospital for all. This top-down monopoly is unacceptable for anyone, especially those willing to risk their lives. We cannot wait for government bureaucrats to decide who lives and who dies. We have to put control back into the hands of the patient. As I see it, the biggest problem we have with our healthcare system is that our insurance really isn't insurance at all. 
In any other industry, insurance only pays for unexpected costs. Therefore, the price is held relatively low. Think about it. What if your car insurance paid for gas, oil, and car washes? First of all, you would have absolutely no reason to shop around for the best gas price. In fact, you might even go to the nicest gas station that serves you free coffee, because what do you care? You pay your little $5 copay card and off you go. Because of that, gas stations would have no reason to try to hold costs down and compete with each other. In fact, they could raise their prices without you even knowing it. How? They simply pass it on to the insurance companies who the following year would simply increase your premiums. This is exactly what's going on with our healthcare system. We've got this spiral in which patients have no reason to shop for prices. Therefore, healthcare providers have no reason to compete and the insurance companies can charge whatever they want without any accountability and we're the ones left footing the bill. Now, I think the two best examples of how a free market, somewhat free market can, could kind of work is in Singapore, which has been duplicated in the state of Indiana. In Singapore, their costs are about one third per person and doctor visits are only about $10. That's cheaper than our copay. The state of Indiana, uh, the employees uh, work, they've, they've had the system in for a few years and it started off where hardly anybody signed up and then within just a couple years, over 75% of the people signed up because they saw what a good system it is. I think the VA healthcare should be converted to a system like the one in Indiana where veterans would be given control over their healthcare dollars. We would put dollars into their pockets and let the veterans decide how and where and when to use them instead of the top-down monopoly. The government letdown of our soldiers doesn't begin with health care. It starts from the day they enlist. There are soldiers deployed overseas who weren't even born when the war on terror began. The U.S. spends more on military than the next seven countries combined. And we're in about 160 different countries around the globe. And what do we have to show for it? In the last 20 years alone, over 500,000 people died in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Pakistan, including 250,000 civilians. So these are mothers and fathers and children who will never get to come home. In every election, politicians promise more peace, but they only deliver more war. If I'm elected president, my first official act will be to bring the troops home. Yeah! I will turn America into one giant Switzerland, armed and neutral. Our military must be trained to defend our shores, but we have to stop meddling in the world and make peace with our world neighbors. The military budget, unfortunately, is far from the only example of how government has misdirected our economy. The IRS taxes Americans at every turn, and the tax system is so complicated that only those with personal accountants and tax lawyers can even navigate the code. That same IRS that taxes us to death probes into every personal financial decision we make, trying to determine how much we owe. Meanwhile, the government itself accumulates more debt. Now, we've got some in Washington say, you know, we need to increase military spending. While on the other half, we've got them saying, well, we need to increase domestic spending. So what's their bipartisan compromise? They simply increase all spending. As your president, my veto pen is going to need a lot of extra ink. is also made possible by the Federal Reserve. When the federal government can't raise taxes, it simply prints more money. Without any backing, since the FDA was created over a century ago, the American dollar has lost 96% of its value. We need to reduce regulations to allow cryptocurrency and any other form of currency to enter the market. As your president, I will first audit and then end the Federal Reserve. Yeah. I will 
will eliminate the IRS and work with Congress towards eliminating the federal income tax altogether. It's time to move the money out of the government sector and back to the people who earned it. Politicians and bureaucrats don't know what you need. You do. Now, when it comes to cutting spending, we cannot take any solutions off the table. I would encourage baseline budgeting. So every year, instead of assuming an increase, we start at zero and then we only add on what's vital. It's time for the government to balance its checkbook in the same way American families do. Given the challenges we face as a country, it's easy to feel like the change I'm talking about just can't happen. But I believe it can because I believe in you. I believe in the individuals who make up our great country. I see America through my grandmother's eyes, a place where the rights of the individual are greater than the power of government, a place where liberty means minimum government and maximum freedom, a place where the American dream isn't a dream at all, it's real and it's right there in front of you because you made it happen. As I ask for your vote this November, it's not because I'm asking you to cast a vote for me, it's because I want you to vote for you. You know best how your money should be spent. You know best what your family's priorities are. You know best what's best for you. Thank you very much.